Hi guys, how are you doing? And welcome to today's second session. This session is very, very, very interesting. Uh, I've been getting questions from a large number of you on LinkedIn and other platforms of what should we do and what where the future what the future holds and what should we learn? Well, this session is the answer for you. Today's session is about machine learning. Uh, it's about dealing with, with massive database and recorded problems. So gear up for the ride. It's, it's a really good one. And just to cut it short, let me introduce our speaker for the day. Our speaker for the day is Haz Biliadi. Haz Biliadi is a currently a senior data engineer scientist with Vine Oil and Gas. He is also the founder and CEO of uh, HBP Intelligent Solutions, LLC. Haas has taught an adjacent professor at multiple universities, including West Virginia University, Marietta College, and St. Francis University. He has uh, also held short courses at co corporations and universities across the world. He is the primary author of Hydraulic Fracturing in Unconventional Reservoirs, first and second edition peer-reviewed and published by um, the Gulf, by Gulf Professional Publishing, LCVR, LCVR I'm sorry. Uh, has earned his uh, bachelor's degree and master's degree in petroleum and natural gas engineering from West Virginia University. Haas, over to you. All right, thank you very much. Welcome everybody and it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, this is one of the uh, topics that I have a lot of passion for, so um, I'm gonna try to contain my passion as much as I can. So let's get started. So first off, I want to kind of get talk about some of the basics first. You know, let's talk about what machine learning is and what it's used for, and talk about some of the terminologies first before going into a little more detail and some case studies towards the end of the presentation. Uh, so first off, what is machine learning? So you probably hear this term machine learning all the time, and you might have the question as far as what machine learning is and how do we use it. So as you guys know, as the volume of data increases human cognition is no longer able to decipher information from the data. When you have a lot of massive amount of data, it becomes very difficult to kind of go in there and you know, extract pattern from the data. When you have, let's just say five wells, 10 wells, I can look at the well production data, I can look at the well design, I can tell you, you know, uh, what's affecting what, right? But when you have 1,000 wells, when you have 2,000 wells, when you have 5,000 wells, you have so much data and each well has different design metrics, different design parameters. So how do, you, how do you extract pattern from that data when so many things are changing? It's almost impossible for, for, for a human to go in there and kind of extract that information because there are so many variables that are changing uh, that, that, that kind of uh, are, 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 are changing at the same time. So that's where machine learning you know, comes in. So machine learning deals with, um, uh, performing a specific task. A simple example is, for example, if I were to um, train somebody on how to play basketball, that is called machine learning. Okay, I'm training somebody on how to play basketball. And on the other hand, if I were to find the best basketball centers, okay, let's just say in Egypt, uh, that is called data mining. Okay, and there's also a term used uh, called artificial intelligence. And what is artificial intelligence? Well, Artificial intelligence is, is using machine intelligence as opposed to using um, human intelligence or animal intelligence. That's what AI is, okay? And just remember that machine learning is a subset of AI. Machine learning is a subset of AI. So we have used so many terms. We've used AI, which is using machine intelligence. We've used machine learning, which is subset of AI, okay? And that's, you know, concentrate, it concentrates on performing a specific task. And then the next one is um, data mining, which is, you know, searching for specific information, okay? There's another um, um, terminology that is, that, is, that is used quite often. It's called deep learning, deep learning. So deep learning refers to using, a, using an algorithm called neural network, okay, with multiple hidden layers, okay? And also there are other forms of, uh, neural network types of algorithms called, you know, convolutional neural network, um, recurrent neural networks, which are used for time series um, and image classification problems. Uh, 
so as you know, you can, you can use different types of algorithms and we'll cover some of the basic ones today and go over some of the examples on how we apply some of these algorithms in the oil and gas industry. Um, that then, you know, um, as we, you know, move forward, we can talk about what each algorithm does and how we can use those. Okay. So that's, that's the first slide. Next slide is there are different types of machine learning. Okay. Uh, you know, we have, uh, the, like the first type is called supervised learning, supervised machine learning. Okay. And it's also referred to as predictive models In supervised learning. You have your inputs and you have your output. So you have a set of input. Let's just say you want to understand the impact of, you know, different, uh, completions, design parameters and geologic features and parameters on production performance. In that case, you can use a supervised machine learning algorithm. Like for example, if you're trying to understand what is the impact of, you know, gas and uh, gas in place, what is the impact of uh, total organic carbon content? What is the impact of, you know, cluster spacing, sand per foot, um, water per foot, sand to water ratio, different design parameters that you use in your completions. On the production performance, that's when you use a supervised machine learning algorithm. So a supervised machine learning algorithm means you simply have your inputs and you have your output. Your, your data has a label and, and that label could be a, a, a one output or it could be multiple outputs. You don't have to have one output. For example, we've done a uh, time series Q per foot uh, prediction and what, like where we had 15 to 20 outputs. So you have your, geologic features, you have your uh, completions design parameters, and then you have your cumulative uh, production per foot uh, or, or cumulative 30 day production per foot, cumulative 60 day production per foot, cum 90 day production per foot, all the way to let's just say cum 720 days production per foot. So you could have one, one output or multiple outputs, okay? So that's called a supervised machine learning algorithm. That's the first type, which, which I'll show you a case study on that today. The next type is called unsupervised, unsupervised. And what I mean by unsupervised is basically you have a set of input features, but you have no output. Your data has no class, okay? In that case, you're trying to cluster your data. You're trying to group your data. And that's when you use a, an unsupervised type of clustering algorithm to cluster your data. And there are different types of algorithms, you know, which, which will, you know, focus on one today and show you a case study on that. Okay. So unsupervised as opposed to supervised learning, you have no output class. Okay. You have no output class. Uh, let's just say if you're trying, let's just say you have a field, uh, let's just say in Egypt. Okay. And there are so many different wells within that field and you're trying to figure out which wells are you know, uh, perform similarly geologically from production perspective, from every perspective, you can apply a clustering technique, which is considered an unsupervised technique to see which wells cluster together and then plot those wells on a map to see, you know, how you can cluster those wells together and how you can define your type curve boundaries. Okay. That's one uh, example uh, of using an unsupervised uh, machine learning algorithm, uh, such as clustering, uh, to cluster the data to figure out how I can define my type curve boundaries. You know, this is a very powerful example to actually perform. Uh, so you don't have to, let's just say, do it manually. You just have, you don't have to, let's just say, if you have a thousand wells, your geologic properties are changing, your field constraints are changing, your, your design is, is, is changing, your, you know, your production performance for each well is changing. So it's hard to go in there and say, okay, I'm going to group these wells together, group these wells together, group these wells together. You have to kind of develop a, an unsupervised clustering um, algorithm to figure out which wells are clustered together. Okay. So that's unsupervised. So we'll talk about a couple of examples on supervised and unsupervised for today's lecture. And then the last one is reinforcement learning and reinforcement learning is just the machine uh, trains itself on a continual basis. One thing to also remember, there's a, one thing called a semi-supervised learning, okay? A semi-supervised learning. And what that is, it basically means that you have, you know, a data set that is not labeled. You first use an unsupervised 
clustering technique to cluster the data. And then once that data is clustered, uh, that clustering column can be used as the output into a supervised machine learning model. So it's a combination of unsupervised and supervised. So you cluster your data, and then from the unsupervised you know, machine learning analysis, it tells you each row of data will belong to a certain cluster. And then you take those clustered information from unsupervised and then use that as the output of the model into your supervised machine learning um, algorithm. Okay. So now we understand what machine learning is. We understand that machine learning is a subset of AI. We understand that what data mining is. We understand what deep, you know, machine learning is, and, and uh, you know, which is the uh, algorithms such as neural network, you know, uh, neural network with multiple hidden layers, recurrent neural network, and and so on and so forth. We talked about different types of machine learning um, uh, models, in like 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 in general. Now let's go in there and just give some examples on each one. So we talked about supervised learning. We talked about unsupervised learning and reinforcement learning. Some examples that you're going to hear a lot. Uh, for example, you probably heard we probably have heard artificial neural network. So ANN is mostly considered to be a supervised machine learning algorithm, which can be used for both regression and classification problem. So what is what is regression versus classification? So regression means you have your output in your machine learning model is actually a, um, um, a, a, a number, is a numeric value, okay? So for example, if you are predicting your EUR, your estimated ultimate recovery per foot, okay? In that case, since your EUR per foot is a numeric number, that is called, you're gonna build a supervised regression model, okay? Now classification is when your output is yes or no, true or false, good, medium, bad, you know, and so on and so forth. It's just a, it's not a numeric value, it's actually a classifier, okay? In those cases, you can use a supervised classification model. And almost all of these algorithms that you see here, ex except probably couple, you can use those for both regression and classification problems almost all of these algorithms. So you can use the artificial neural network for, um, to, to, to build a supervised regression model, or you could use artificial neural network to build a supervised classification model, okay? Classification model. Other types of supervised that you're gonna hear a lot is support vector machine, very powerful, very powerful for both classification and regression. K nearest neighbor, one of the simplest types of machine learning algorithm, but uh, it, it, it's, very, it's also very, very, like very powerful uh, that uses uh, di you know, distance-based calculations to figure out based on the nearest neighbors, uh, which, which algorithm will be assigned to, which, which, uh, which um, uh, classifier each instance will be assigned to. Uh, you have random forest, uh, which we're gonna talk about this today. Uh, extra trees, uh, random forest and extra trees can be used for feature ranking. Very, very powerful algorithm for, for feature ranking. Decision tree, um, gradient boost, you have the multi-linear regression, uh, logistic regression. Okay, so these are some different types of algorithms within supervised machine learning algorithm. The next one is called unsupervised. And unsupervised, some examples of unsupervised are k-means clustering. Uh, you have your hierarchical clustering. Uh, you have your DB scan and a priori algorithm. We're going to talk about k-means clustering today, um, and, and and just show you an example as far as how we applied k-means clustering to solve liquid loading problem. And then some of the algorithms on reinforcement learning are Markov decision process and Q learning. Okay, and Q learning. So now we, have, we, have, like we understand different types of machine learning. Uh, we understand some of the algorithms underneath each type of machine learning. Now let's talk about how do we build a model. Let's talk about a workflow uh, to understand how we build a machine learning model and, and what the process for that is. So I'm probably going to spend 10, 15 minutes just on this slide because it's so important to understand the overall workflow before we dive into you know, some example and case studies. Okay. 
So step number one, as you guys know, step number one is collecting data. You know, you cannot perform a machine learning project without having data, right? So collecting that data uh, from different sources is very important. Now, a problem that the industry in general has faced is that we have data in different places. We have it in Excel and this database, Aries and PhD Win and WellView and different types, different sources of databases, you know? So now it is the time that the industry needs to focus on a central type of database where all your data is located in a central data warehouse, in a central data warehouse. And what I mean by a central data warehouse it just means as opposed to having a bunch of Excel's and, and Aries database and all of these plates, you know, information in different places where it's hard to go and grab, you bring all of it into one central place where you can access all that data. So the best way to think about a central data warehouse is, is basically think about a gigantic Excel, just think about a gigantic Excel with, you know, columns and rows of data. Everything is in one central place. So when you go and, and let's just say if you're interested in design parameters, if you're interested in um, any type of information, you can just go in there and grab it, you know, and you don't have to go in and for example, um, you know, ask this guy or ask this guy, where is the data? Where is this data? Where is that data? It's just not efficient, right? So the, go the, the key to a successful project is to have one central place. And once that data is in one central place, then gathering that data becomes much, much easier, right? So, so to give you an example, right now, the industry has spent 80% of the time, 80% of the time, you know, on, 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 on average, you know, some people are much better off, some people are still very manual, you know, just gathering that data. Think about that. You're gonna spend 80% of your time gathering, collecting that data. What if I told you that five, 10 years from now, if we can reduce that 80% to like 5% or less than 5%, how much value can you add? A tremendous amount of value, right? Because now you have everything in one central place. You don't have to go into different places to gather the data. You don't have to do anything manual, you know? So it, it adds a tremendous value. So our vision is that in the future, right now is 80% in the future, that 80% is gonna be much, much lower because now you have all your data in one central place. So that's why, a lot of companies, not just the oil and gas industry, you know, in different industries, banking and real estate and every single industry is, is, is finding the need for uh, data engineers where you gather the data, where you centralize all your data in one place, you know, in addition, because if you don't have your data uh, readily available, it's very hard to do data science on that, like on that data. It's very hard to do data analytics on that data. So you first, the first step is to gather and collect that data, right? So let's just say you collected the data, you have, you've identified which data you want to collect, okay? And what I would recommend is start off with gathering as much data uh, as, as, as you can, okay? If you think, for example, you might need this input feature in your model, but you're not sure, just gather it. And if you're not going to use it later, you know, it's fine. Don't, don't, don't use it. You can uh, set it aside, you know? But initially, when you're in the process of gathering that data, it's very hard to gather everything at first, the first time, as opposed to going back and, you know, uh, getting the rest of the information. So now you've gathered your data, you collected your data. The next step is, is, is data cleaning. And, and in, in the step two and three, um, I'm going to talk about um, some of the procedures in, in, the, in these three steps and then go back and continue with the workflow. So one of the most important steps is in machine learning to do any kind of machine learning analysis is to visualize the data. All I'm asking when I say visualize, do a simple uh, distribution plot, do a simple box plot, do a simple scatter plot, understand what kind of data you have. One of the mistakes that a lot of the beginners make is that they jump in, they, they get impatient, they just wanna gather the data and jump in into just, you know, uh, putting all that information into an algorithm. Well, I'm sorry, it doesn't work that way. You have to, for the first step that is recommend, highly recommended, is truly visualizing the data, understanding what's in the data to find anomalous points. If you, if you do a simple scatter plot of this versus this, or parameter X versus parameter Y, you're gonna see if you have an anomalous point. For example, if the average you know, um, gas in place, 
okay, gas in place for your field is 200 to 300 BCF per section. Okay, and now you have one point that says my average gas in place for that well is 1,000 BCF per section. Well, what happened? You know, you, that point is probably an, 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 an erroneous point, right? If you include that in your model, then your model will try to extrapolate and it's gonna have a hard time, you're gonna have a hard time um, getting an accurate, building an accurate model. So it's very important to visualize the data. And what I recommend is simply using a distribution plot to understand the distribution of each parameter. Box plots, you know, which, which would give you kind of which, which data points are outliers, okay? And then just scatter plots, which also give, give you a lot of perspective on some of the outliers in your model. Okay, so data visualization is a very, very important step before you do anything. Okay, that's, that's the first thing you gotta do. When you, if, if you're doing any kind of machine learning analysis using, let's just say Python, okay, or R, the first step that I do is import, you know, uh, visualization libraries, such as Matplotlib, Seaborn, Plotly, and Cufflinks. That's the first step that you do. You import those libraries and you start visualizing every single parameter to make sure you have a good handle and understanding of every single parameter, okay? So now when you visualize your data, you also uh, you know, figure out which, which parameters might have anomalous points. You know, if, if you have a design that has an anomaly, then you kind of, you're gonna be able to capture that immediately. And then either uh, understand the validity of that point, or if, you, if, the, if the validity is in question, simply remove that parameter from your model, okay? So that's called anomaly detection. Next is called collinearity removal. Collinearity removal. And what I mean by that is, I'm gonna show you an example in, in a minute when we do a case study, is to remove parameters that are highly correlated. For example, or, or, or I'm sorry, to remove the input features, input features that are highly correlated. For example, if you're like, like you know that porosity and permeability, porosity, uh, you know, and permeability, what, what, you know, what, one is calculated from, from another, right? If you include both into your model, you're gonna see that porosity and perm is gonna have a high, um, a high, high Pearson correlation coefficient or, 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 or high collinearity, which means they essentially both provide the same exact information. Porosity and perm provide the same exact information. So when you build your machine learning model, would you include both porosity and perm into your model or would you use just one of them? I would just use one of them, right? Because why would you, you know, include the same exact, you know, uh, very highly collinear parameters into your model? Your model you know, uh, you, you're essentially making your model more confusing and you're providing, uh, because you're providing, you know, the same, same amount of data into your model. So you remove collinear parameters. And I'll show you how you can do that. It's, it's a very simple analysis. You can do your, you can use Pearson correlation coefficient to remove your uh, collinear parameters, okay? Remove your collinear parameters from your analysis, okay? Step number four, once you have, uh, detected your anomalous points, once you visualize your data, once you have removed the collinear parameters, collinear parameters, the next step is to do your feature um, ranking and selection. And I'll show you, you can use some of these algorithms like random forest or extra trees to rank your features to see which features fall at the top and which features fall at the bottom of your tornado chart, okay? The features that fall at the bottom, it just means that those features have the minimum amount of impact on your output, okay? So you could possibly and potentially remove some of those features from your model so you can make your model um, more, 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 more simple, you know, or, 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 or simpler as opposed to more complicated, okay? So feature ranking and selection is a very important process, very important process. And what, what I would say is, a lot of the feature um, uh, selection comes from your domain expertise, okay? Um, one thing that I'm gonna talk about is to, you know, to have the data scientist, uh, to combine data scientists with domain experts, okay? 
do not give a machine learning project to just a data scientist if they don't have any domain expertise. Make because a lot of their feature selection comes from your domain expertise. If you have worked in the oil and gas industry for 10 years, you understand the problem very, very well, okay? You might not have the, uh, the statistical or mathematical understanding to do data science, but if they combine you, the domain expert, with a data scientist, that's the key to success in machine learning projects, okay? That's the key to success in machine learning projects. So feature selection also is a function of your domain expertise. So the more domain expertise that you have, the more you combine the domain experts with the data scientists, the, the more successful the project will be. The more successful the project will be, okay? So now we talked about a feature ranking and selection, and then right before you apply any type of machine learning algorithm, make sure to either normalize or standardize your data. Now, some algorithms do not require neither normalization nor standardizations, okay? But for example, when, when you use an artificial neural network or when you use support vector machine or some of these algorithms, you know, you have to first normalize your data. And what I mean by normalizing the data, here is the equation. I'm, I'm just referring to, you know, taking each data, each, in, each instance, minus the min of that, you know, uh, column, divided by max minus min. This would essentially um, make the data to have a scale between zero and one. So let's just say you have, let's just say you have, um, uh, you know, uh, porosity, uh, that ranges from, you know, 5% to 35%, okay? And then you have, for example, sand per foot for your completions design that ranges from 1,000 pound per foot to 4,000 pound per foot, okay? If you don't scale these parameters to be on the same scale, zero and one, then when you train your neural network model, when you train different types of machine learning algorithms, you're gonna have uh, you're gonna have uh, biases in your model, right? So it's very important to normalize normalize your data um, uh, prior to feeding that data into your machine learning algorithm. Okay, that's called data feature normalization. Okay, the next one is called feature standardization, and what feature standardization is is just taking you know each instance minus the mean or the average divided by the standard deviation. And what feature standardization does, it, it, it would make sure that you'll have a mean of zero and a standard deviation of one for each column, okay? Now, some algorithms such as, for example, uh, distance-based algorithms like k-means clustering, um, um, you know, hierarchical clustering and, and so on and so forth uh, require standardization. And other algorithms are more successful with normalization. So it depends on the type of algorithm that you're gonna use, you would either normalize or standardize your data prior to feeding it into a machine learning algorithm. And some tree-based algorithms do not require neither normalization nor standardization, okay? So it really depends on which algorithm you're trying to use and what you're trying to do. So now we understood the first five essential pieces within items one, two, and three. So now let's go back to our famous chart here. So we have step one, step two, step three. We've covered these three in detail. Now the next step is now we, you know, we've, the data is ready. We've visualized it. We understand it. We've selected features. You know, uh, now the data is ready to be fed into a machine learning algorithm. Okay. But before we do that, before we do that, there is one important step, which is called um, cross-validation or um, you, you, there are different types of cross-validation techniques, okay? I'm just going to make it simple today and just focus on, on just uh, one simple one, okay? Ca call it train-test split, okay? Train-test split. And what I mean by that is you have, let's just say you have a thousand rows of data. You have a thousand wells, okay? If you have a thousand wells, and you're trying to, you know, feed into your uh, feed feed in your 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 uh, data into a machine learning algorithm. Prior to doing that, split that a thousand rows to a 70-30% split, which means 70% of the data will be used as training, 
and 30% will be used as the testing set. 70% training, 30% testing. Now, why 70-30? This is just one common rule of thumb. You can do 80-20, you can do 90-10, you can do 85-15, okay? Uh, depends on how big your data set is and, and what you're trying to do, okay? Let's just say I'm gonna go with a 70-30 split, which means out of 1,000 rows, I'm gonna use 700 rows for my training, and I'm gonna use 300 rows for my testing set, okay? So now, train, use, let's just say use, let's just say any type of um, uh, machine learning, let's just say you're gonna use uh, artificial neural network, okay? Apply the, train the model based on the 70%, okay? And then apply that train model to see how the model performs on the test set, on the 30% test set that the model hasn't seen before. So let's just say you apply and your training accuracy was 95%, okay, 95%. Your R square on your model was 95% on the training set. Now you apply to your test set, which is 30% of the data that you withheld, that you withheld. Now, if your accuracy goes down to 40%, well, what happened? Your model is called an overfitted model, which means you've memorized the trend in your model. You've memorized it, you didn't understand it. You did not, general, you did not build a general model. I'll give you a simple example. It's like you know, uh, having a test tomorrow, okay? And then going and memorizing every single question. As soon as the professor changes the question slightly, uh-oh, you can't answer it. Why is that? Because you did not understand the problem. You memorized the problem. As soon as you change the question slightly, you miss the question. And that's, it can happen to machine learning models. In machine learning models, you, you, your model can be overfitted, which means it does a great job on the, training, on, 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 on the training data. And then when you apply on the test set, it completely fails, right? So that's a bad model. You have to make sure you don't use that model, right? Now, let's just say you apply and get a training accuracy of, let's just say, 95% or 90%. Then you apply it on the test set, which, is, which, which was the 30% of the data that was withheld, and your accuracy also is around 90%, okay? That's good. That means the model that you trained on the training set and you apply on, on the test set with health pretty well, with health pretty well. So, uh, so this is just one um, uh, illustration of how you can use you know, uh, a train test split to make sure when you build a model, uh, you can, the, like the model's accuracy, the model's generalization capabilities will be withheld, you know, will, will, will be uh, strong when you apply on the test set. One more thing that people also do, aside from training and testing, they can also apply it one last time prior to applying it like, like real time, for example. They apply it on another blind set, on another set of data that the model hasn't seen again, just to make sure the model still withholds pretty strongly, okay? So you have your training set, your test set, and you can also apply it one last time prior to making your, 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 your model going into um, you know, uh, a, 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 a real-time basis to make sure your model is still uh, has a strong um, generalization capability and has a good accuracy, okay? So that's pretty much it. You visualize your data, you clean your data, you, you've, done your culinary, you've done your culinary removal, you've done your uh, feature ranking, you've selected your features, you apply, um, uh, let's just say, a type of machine learning algorithm to solve your problem. You've, you've done your cross-validation, applied on training set and testing set and also blind set. And now you're good. If you're happy with the model, great job. Now you move into the next step, which is either model, you know, applying the model real time or simply uh, using the model as a static model to obtain, to do a sensitivity analysis to understand what is the impact of, for example, different features on your model output, okay, on your model output. And this is all, all the, like the reference is, is in the, in, like in chapter 24 of this book, okay? So we've talked about this. We've talked about feature normalization and standardization. As I said, combining domain expertise and the statisticians are, is, is very important. 
you know, you cannot, do not hire a bunch of data scientists without hiring the domain experts, without combining them with domain experts. For example, if you're trying to solve a production engineering problem, okay, make sure you combine a production engineer with a lot of experience with the data scientists to solve that problem. Because the production engineer that has, for example, 10 years of experience in the field understands the problem very well. And when those guys work together, that's the key to success in a machine learning project. It's very, very important. A lot of the machine learning projects fail just because of that. You know, we have a lot of people from the, from the, from the tech industry, from, 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 from Silicon Valley that comes in and try to do oil and gas projects. But usually they fail. And the reason for that is because they hire, for example, a bunch of data scientists without any domain experts. And, and you know, the, 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 the project simply fails. So please, 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 if you're going to, you know, apply machine learning within your organization, hire, you know, combine the domain experts and the, da you know, and the data scientists together for a successful machine learning project. Then, so now let's talk about one of the algorithms and show you how we applied that algorithm to solve a problem. So first, let me define a problem. So the, the problem is liquid loading, okay? Liquid loading uh, is simply when, you know, the gas doesn't have uh, enough, enough um, um, uh, velocity to come up the well bore, um, uh, or I'm sorry, the, like, like when, when, when the water doesn't, doesn't have enough critical rate to come up the well bore and clean the well, right? So your well becomes loaded, you know, and that happens, that's a phenomenon that happens on dry gas wells very, very often. So when the water doesn't have the capacity to bring itself to surface, you have to detect that, right? So one of the ways that the industry uses right now to detect liquid loading is using Turner and Coleman. Turner and Coleman rays, these are, uh, you know, um, uh, empirical equations that were developed back in the 50s or 60s on, you know, developed for vertical wells. So we said, well, why can we apply a, an unsupervised technique, okay, to cluster the data into two clusters, loaded versus unloaded, okay? So that's when we, you know, used k-means clustering, k-means clustering, which is an unsupervised machine learning algorithm to do that. So what is k-means? So k-means is one of the most widely used unsupervised machine learning algorithms. Uh, it can be used to apply to different problems like type curve clustering that I talked about, um, liquid loading detection, uh, frac screen out clustering and so on and so forth. Okay, now let's talk about how it works. So here's, here's an example again. Let, let me show you exactly how it works. So. On the left-hand side, this, this figure right here, let's just say you have, um, you know, a green instances and red instances, okay? Green instances and red instances. Let's just say you have two features and you're trying to uh, cluster, use k-means clustering to cluster that data, okay? So first, the first step is to randomly select these two uh, centroids, you see this red, centroid here and this green centroid, okay? You randomly initialize these two centroids. Why did I choose two? The number of clusters is a function of your domain expertise. You know, if you, for example, are trying to uh, solve a liquid loading problem, you know that uh, a, 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 a well is either loaded or unloaded. So you're gonna choose two clusters. So in this case, I'm gonna choose, for example, two clusters here. Two, two centroids to start with. The, the next thing the model will do, the model will measure the instance, uh, will measure the distance, the distance from each of these points, each of these instances to each centroid. So the measure from this instance to this green centroid and the measure from this instance to this red centroid. Since this green centroid is closer to this, um, uh, si since this green instance is closer to this green centroid, it will be assigned as green, okay? And then since, for example, this instance is closer to, um, you know, um, uh, this centroid, it will be assigned as red. That's the first step. You're just simply measuring 
the Euclidean distance, you know, from each instance to each uh, randomly initialized centroids, okay? So you're gonna measure the distance from here to here and from here to here. You're gonna measure the distance from here to here and from here to here, okay? That's the first step in k-means clustering. The next step, so now you have these instances that were you know, classified or clustered as red, and then these instances that were classified as green. Now what you do is you take the average, you take the average of these instances right here, okay? Then you take the average of the red instances right here. Then you move this centroid to the average. So that's what happened here. The centroid went from here to the average of these centroids, okay, to the average, so like somewhere here. Then this green centroid was moved to the average of these centroids, somewhere right here, okay? Then what happened was, then we measured each instance to each centroid. Again, so we measured, uh, for example, uh, this, this green centroid, uh, or this green instance to this green centroid and this, this instance to this red centroid and reassigned, reassigned um, you know, the, um, whether each instance will be under green or red, okay? Reassign them. Then what do we do? Then we repeat it again. We take the average of these green instances, these green instances, and we take the average of these red instances Okay, then we move the, this green centroid to the average of green instances, which, which moved here. Then we move this red centroid to the average of the red centroids, which moves right here. And then we keep repeating this process, keep repeating under different iterations until the model is converged. When the model is converged, when these two are converged, it gets to a point that these centroids cannot move anymore. You know, they have been finally converged. And these are your two clusters. So each row of data will be assigned to either cluster zero, okay, or cluster one. Cluster zero or cluster one. Why did I choose two? Because that is a function of my domain expertise. I know I'm trying to solve a liquid loading problem and I'm trying to understand, you know, what is the impact of, of um, um, uh, you, you know, applying k-means clustering to to to, my, to detecting liquid loading. Okay, so I'm, I'm so I'm trying to solve the problem independent of using Turner and Coleman rates. I'm not going to use Turner and Coleman rates. I'm just going to apply k-means clustering and use that, which is much more accurate. So, which data did I use for this analysis? I use my gas rate. I use my casing pressure, tubing pressure, line pressure. Right, these are very important uh, production, you know, um, metrics or, or, or production data, and um, basically I applied some type of pre-processing techniques to, to that data, and then applied k-means clustering to that to determine, uh, you know, two clusters whether the well would be under cluster zero or cluster one, and each one represents the loaded condition versus the unloaded condition, loaded versus unloaded. Okay. Uh, so I hope this makes sense. So it's a pretty simple process. All you have to do is you initialize the centroids, measure the instance from each, each data point to each centroid, assign these instances to that centroid, assign these instances to this centroid because uh, the distance is closer, okay? And then take the average, move the centroid to the average, take the average of these, move the centroid to the average, reassign all the all of the instances to either green or red okay reassign all of the instances to either green or red and then take the average of the green instance take the average of the red instances and then move the cluster centroid to the average move the red cluster centroid to the average keep repeating the process until your model has been converged okay so now what is the outcome the outcome is this you can see here date on the x-axis versus gas rate on the y-axis. So I wanna use um, um, a, 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 a um, uh, k-means clustering to, to detect 
uh, where my data will be loaded and where my data would be you know, considered as unloaded. You can see here, all of these green uh, data points are considered as unloaded. Okay, these are, let's just say cluster number um, uh, zero. Okay, then the red instances right here, that's where my, 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 my well started loading up. So that is considered to be cluster one. Okay, I, I just simply plotted, um, uh, you know, gas rate versus uh, time. And then I'm simply uh, classifying as, you know, which data points uh, fell under cluster zero and which data points fell under cluster one. And you can see the green data points uh, fell under cluster zero, which is unloaded. And the red data points fell under cluster one, which is loaded condition. And that's pretty much, now that you have the K-means model developed, you can apply this model real time, okay? You can apply your liquid loading model real time to detect as soon as a well becomes loaded, let's identify it, let's send alarms, and let's go and fix it, okay? So you don't lose production during that time. You know, if, if you wait, for example, two or three days or a week or two, sometimes a month or two prior to detecting this, it becomes very, very time consuming and challenging. You know, if you have a production engineer that goes through every single well and trying to find, you know, where, you know, it became loaded and what happened, it's very time consuming. If you have a thousand wells, 2000 wells, 5000 wells, you know, you cannot have a guy going in there every single day and click through wells and find those, those trends. So you can build a, um, a, a machine learning model such as came using, you know, an algorithm such as K-means algorithm, okay, to detect where your well will be loaded and where your well is not gonna be loaded. And then as soon as it becomes loaded, you uh, implement it like real time in the field and you can implement this through edge devices in the field uh, through a system called IoT. Uh, and then once it's implemented real time, you can capture those liquid loaded points immediately and save production and save money for the company. So now this, this, was, this was one example of using unsupervised K-means clustering, which is by the way, one type of algorithm. There are so many different types of algorithms as, as we discussed. And there, 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 are, there, are, there are more that I, even, that I haven't even mentioned in this presentation. I'm just uh, going through some of the you know, basic and most important ones, okay? The next uh, project that I'm trying to solve is I have a set of input features, okay? I have my uh, geologic features, I have my completions features, and I'm trying to understand what is the impact of different geologic and completions design features on my production output. And I've defined my production output to be either EUR per thousand feet, okay, or cum or cumulative production per foot, okay? Let's just say cum two year production per foot, okay? So I'm trying to understand what is the impact of each feature on my output. So the first thing that I'm trying to do is I'm gonna use random forest. And as you guys know, random, as we discussed, random forest is a powerful uh, supervised machine learning algorithm. What random forest does, random forest is basically an ensemble of decision trees. As opposed to using one decision tree, you, have, you can use thousands of decision trees and take the average okay, of all those decision trees in your model. One of the powerful aspects of using random forest is called feature ranking, which means the random forest will tell you which features have the most important impact on your production output, okay? On your production output. So in this case, my output was, you know, Q per foot or, or EUR per thousand feet. And you can see it ranked the most important features at the top and the least important features at the bottom, at the bottom. So it, it, this is telling me that my cluster spacing, my cluster spacing, which is one of the completions design parameters, has one of the most important impact on my production performance. Followed by gas content, which is or, or called gas in place in this case, followed by prop and per foot. So now the question is, if you are in charge, 
and you, you, you're kind of a decision maker, which parameters would you hone in on to optimize your production? Would you optimize your production based on uh, cluster spacing and prop and per foot? You have no control over gas in place, right? Or would you focus on shot density, for example, in this case? Well, I would definitely focus on parameters that have a huge impact or a significant impact on my production output in this case, right? Which are cluster spacing and prop and per foot. So you want to hone in on those parameters to really optimize those parameters as much as you can, because that will add the most value. Now you could add some value, you know, if you optimize your shot density, but before you optimize your shot density, you better make sure all the other parameters are actually optimized prior to moving into your shot density, because these are have, 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 have a larger influence on your, on, your, on, 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 on your feature ranking. So that's one of the powerful algorithms such as random forest, that's how random forest can be used to, for, for feature ranking. And also it can be used for feature selection. You can, for example, remove some of these least important features at the bottom of the tree, if, 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 you, if you would like to, okay? So remember the features at the bottom have the lowest impact on the model and the features at the top have the largest impact on the, on the model, okay? So now we've discussed k-means clustering, we've discussed random forests. Now let's talk about <clears throat> artificial neural network, okay? Just a basic type and talk about what it is and how we can use artificial neural network, you know, to, uh, for, for, for production optimization. Now the idea of INN or ANN uh, came from, you know, uh, brain neurons. And uh, the way artificial neural network works actually, if I go to the slide here, you can see here. So I have my input features. You can see, for example, gas in place, uh, sand per cluster, you can say sand per foot, water per cluster or water per foot, number of perfs, stage spacing, cluster spacing, and so on and so forth, okay? This is my input layer on this side, on the left-hand side. I have my hidden layer. Okay, my hidden layer right here. And then within my hidden layer, I have, you know, multiple neurons. In this case, I have one, two, three, and so on and so forth. A lot of neurons right here. Okay. Then these input layer is connected to my hidden layer. Okay. Then the hidden layer uh, is connected to my output. In this case, I'm using EUR, estimated ultimate recovery. Okay. EUR per thousand feet as my output. So basically I'm trying to understand what is the relationship, what is the impact of these features, okay? These features here on my output feature, which is EUR per thousand feet. So, my, so an ANN has an input layer, a hidden layer, and an output layer, okay? Within the hidden layer, you have neurons. You have multiple neurons in this case. And these are one of the hyperparameters one of the hyperparameters uh, that you use uh, in your ANN model, okay? So what I would do is every single one of these neurons has a weight and a bias associated with them, has a weight and a bias. So the way it works is, let's just say my EUR is, uh, you know, my actual EUR, okay, is 2.2 BCF per thousand feet, okay? 2.2 BCF per thousand feet. Now I'm gonna feed in the model, train the model, and then I'm going to predict my EUR. And my EUR actually turned out to be 1.8 BCF instead of 2.2. So the predicted EUR was 1.8, my actual EUR was 2.2. Now what happens is it's gonna go back, it's gonna back propagate, go back to this hidden layer and change the weights and biases of this hidden um, layer of, 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 of these hidden neurons, okay? And predict again, predict the EUR. Now my EUR is 1.9 uh, BCF per thousand feet. And my actual EUR is still 2.2, right? So 1.9, 2.2, we're getting closer. It's gonna go back to this hidden layer and it's going to change the weights or the coefficients and biases of each one of these hidden neurons. And it's gonna predict again. And now it's, let's just say 2.1 BCF per thousand feet. It's gonna keep going until the, um, 
uh, difference between actual minus predicted is minimized. So in a and model, we're trying to minimize a lost function, a loss function, or they call it a cost function. We're trying to minimize a cost function. And the way you minimize it is through a back propagation. You keep updating the weights and biases of these hidden neurons and then predicting until the, actual, the, the, the predicted values you know, are close to actual values. And the predicted value, you can compare the predicted values with the actual values with what? Through what? Through the train test split that we talked about. Remember we said withhold 70% of the data and then apply to the testing set 30% of the data? That's how you do it. You just keep um, uh, doing the back propagation until you know, your model is optimized and until the difference between um, min and max, between actual and predicted values is basically minimized. So the objective, if somebody asks you, the objective is in, in using an NN function or an NN model or algorithm, the objective is to minimize a cost function. And that cost function is defined as the difference between uh, actual values minus predicted values. Okay, actual values minus predicted values. So now, as you can see, uh, we have different parameters in my AN model. We have number of neurons. I can, you know, uh, iterate on the type of function, the type of solver that I have. Do I have a, uh, you know, a stochastic gradient descent solver? What type of solver do I have? How many neurons do I use? There are so many different hyperparameters, hyperparameters within each algorithm, okay? So that's why the next step is to do grid search. And what grid search does in grid search optimization, it tries to find the best hyperparameters, the best you know, number of neurons, the best number of, you know, the, the, the best type of solver, the, the best type of you know, uh, activation function and so on and so forth in each model, okay? To get the highest accuracy on your testing set, okay? So for example, in grid search, it's like a nested for loop. You go through, uh, you know, uh, what is the uh, testing set accuracy when I have um, 20 neurons, when I use an activation function of, let's just say, logistic, and when I use a solver of stochastic gradient descent. Now it's gonna go back and say, okay, now give me the testing accuracy when I use 25 neurons instead of 20, and use an activation function of, let's say, logistic regression, and then use um, um, uh, you know, a, a solver of stochastic gradient descent again. It's gonna keep changing or, or keep uh, iterating on different uh, hyperparameters until my testing accuracy has been, has been optimized. And that's, that's called a grid search optimization, which means you have selected the best fine tuning parameters for your model. Okay, so now that we understand the basics of a and model, now let's go and through, a, through an example here. So you can see here, I have two charts here. One is, is, is basically I used Seaborn library, Seaborn library in Python to do this pair plot on the, on the left-hand side. And I also use a Seaborn library, same library in Python to do a heat map and what I have inside the heat map is the Pearson correlation coefficient. And Pearson correlation coefficient is defined as covariance of X comma Y divided by standard deviation of X times standard deviation of Y. What Pearson correlation coefficient, it, it is simply your R, simply your R. You guys know your R square? Your Pearson correlation coefficient is simply your R, okay? So, in this case, you can see here, for example, if you look at density, my, my Bach density is, has a Pearson correlation coefficient of minus, minus 0.97 with respect to my gas in place, which essentially means that as I have a higher gas in place, my Bach density will be lower, right? So if my Pearson correlation coefficient between my Bach density and my gas in place is 0.97, would you include both parameters in your model? I would recommend, I would definitely recommend to drop one because you know, gas density 
you know, and, and, and I'm sorry, bulk density and your gas in place essentially provide the same information. So drop one, drop one and remove the collinear parameters. And that's what I meant to say. Well, when I, when I said removing collinear parameters, you simply do a heat map of uh, input features uh, versus one another. And then you see which parameters are in red or, or you know, or high, high blue. So remove anything that has uh, an absolute value of, of, of um, minus positive, let's just say 80 or 90, per, you know, 90 uh, percent. So remove those parameters because then you're not using collinear parameters in your model and removing that noise from your data, okay? So this is an example of how we use Pearson correlation coefficient to remove those collinear parameters prior to feeding in, into, your, into your model. Then this pair plot here just simply shows you you know, if you have anomalous points, you know, if you plot different input features on this side versus one another, it basically shows you uh, which one of the input features, you know, have, um, uh, have outliers or have, uh, you know, uh, and like anomalous points. You can identify those from, a, from, from, like from a pair plot, or you can just zoom in and just do a simple scatter plot. But very important, anomaly detection and collinearity removal are two of the main steps when you, when, when you use a machine learning model, okay? So now the last step, so now you've built your machine learning model, you've built your, let's just say an artificial neural network model, okay? And you're trying to understand what is the impact of each uh, parameter, okay? On the production uh, output, which in this case, the, the output of, of the model was EUR per thousand feet or QM, production uh, per thousand feet, okay? So once you have a trained model, now you can understand what is the impact of each, each parameter independently on the production output. Remember before you had, let's just say a thousand wells. And from a thousand wells, you had, you had let's say 15 parameters. From 15 parameters, you know, they all change. You use different, you know, sand per foot, you use different uh, you know, cluster spacing and so on and so forth. So it's very hard to extract pattern from the data. So the entire essence of this is to train a model. And once you have a trained model with high accuracy that you're confident about, now we can do a sensitivity analysis. And we, we use actually a, a, a one variable at a time sensitivity called OVAT, which means I change one variable at a time to see the impact of that variable on my uh, output performance. So for example, if I change my problem per foot, okay, my problem per foot, what is the impact of changing my problem per foot from a thousand pound per foot or, or 1100 pound per foot to 2000 pound per foot? What is the resulting predicted Q per foot on the Y axis? Again, these are these points that you see here are predicted values. These are not from just a simple scatter plot. This is you train a model. Now you're trying to understand what is the import the impact of each feature on the production output on the production output, which in this case was Q uh, gas per thousand feet. And you can see here as I increase my uh, prop and per foot, you can also see an increase in Q gas per foot. Now, what's the advantage of this? You can quantitatively, you can qualitatively and quantitatively say, what is the impact of each variable on my production performance? So you can say, when I go from, you know, a thousand pound per foot, my Q per foot was, you know, let's just say 410. And, and when I change to 2000 pound per foot, my Q per foot now is around, you know, uh, 650 or so. Okay, 650 or so. So you can quant qualitatively and quantitatively say, what is the impact of each variable on my production performance? And another sensitivity that I did was, you know, cluster spacing. This, these two parameters had the highest impact on my uh, production output, right? From, from the random forest chart that I showed you guys. So I'm trying to understand what is the impact of cluster spacing on my Q per foot? And you can see here, as I increase my cluster spacing, from 20 feet all the way to 70 feet, I can see a, a, it's almost an exponential, it's not exponential, but almost an exponential 
decline in my um, in my in my uh, production performance. So when I had a 20 foot cluster spacing, my production was way up here. When I tried 70 foot cluster spacing on some of these wells, my production is down here. So this allows you, this gives you a tool to understand the quantitative and qualitative impact of each parameter on the production performance. So this is called an OVAT, one variable at a time sensitivity analysis as quiet use. And that's what we, what, what, like what we did in, the, in this project for this book that we published to show a case study within the oil and gas industry, how we can use, for example, an a and model or you know, a different supervised model to predict what happens to my cum gas per foot um, uh, you know, at, at different types of scale. Now, one last thing I wanna mention is that you have to be very careful. Do not use machine learning for extrapolation, okay? Use machine learning for interpolation. So for example, if you used, if your data set was between 1,000 to 2,000 pound per foot, um, do not try to predict what would happen at 4,000 pound per foot because the model has never seen that before. So it's very challenging to ask a machine learning model to you know, extrapolate for you. you know? And that's one of the drawbacks, one of the weaknesses of machine learning models in general. So you can use it for interpolation, but do not use for extrapolation, okay? Do not use for extrapolation. So that's pretty much it. Um, uh, you know, we've talked about all of these um, different algorithms and what machine learning is. Uh, feel free to, you know, send me any, you know, questions if you have. I'll be happy to answer you or just add me on LinkedIn and, you know, I'll, I'll be able to answer any questions that you might have and I'll uh, take any questions that you have right now. Uh, thank you so much for your presentation. It was a great one. So I have a question for you. Yep. Uh, the, the first question is actually an, an interesting question. Yeah. Uh, the artificial intelligence and machine learning are replacing, are they replacing the commercial petroleum engineering software such as Petrel and so on? Um, not, not necessarily yet because, you know, the, you know, the, uh, the advantage of like, for example, some of the commercial softwares such as Petrel and, and, and CMG and, you know, different types of, um, you know, softwares that are out there is that, for example, if you don't have any data, you know, what are you going to do? If, if I didn't have any data, for example, to do a machine learning analysis, um, then it, it, with those softwares, you can use those softwares, for example, to uh, do numerical simulation to, you know, um, uh, to, to kind of predict what, like, what, what happens to my production performance at different designs. But I don't think it's replacing those. Now, uh, so the, 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 the power of machine learning comes in when you have a lot of data. And then when you have a lot of data, um, I would definitely try to use the power of data to extract information from my data. Petrel and CMG and all those platforms are, are great when you don't have any data. When you go into a new field, if you go into, into a new exploration field, you have no data, you cannot really do machine learning, for example, uh, of what, 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 like what we just did here in terms of understanding the impact of different design parameters on my production performance. So someone asking about what other subsets of um, uh, artificial intelligence other than machine learning? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So uh, machine learning is, is the main subset of artificial intelligence. And th that, that's pretty much the, you can, you can also say, um, you know, uh, data science, data analytics, you know, all of those could be a subset of AI. Um, uh, you know, so it, like deep learning, for example, is, is, is a subset of machine learning. Uh, you know, so, so you can also consider data science, data analytics, a subset of AIs. Uh, I have a second question. Someone asking about what, what should be uh, the steps to be a good data engineer, data analyst. Okay, so I would say the first step is to to be a data engineer, or data analyst, or to be a data scientist. He mentioned data engineer or data analyst. Analyst. Data analyst. Okay. Um, I would say that the, like the first step is to uh, learn how to um, 
code and, and the basic fundamentals of coding. For example, if you're going to be a um, data engineer or even a data analyst, you know, uh, I, I highly recommend that you get familiar with, for example, different packages like SQL. You know, how do I code within SQL? Or even, you know, uh, coding within Python or coding within R. You know, these are uh, programming languages that you can use to code within them. Um, and, and once you know the fundamentals of coding, I would take a few classes online to make sure you understand the fundamentals. Uh, because once you know how to code, then a lot of these tedious processes in terms of gathering information, compiling them into one place becomes much, much easier. Um, uh, so that's why I highly recommend to use, uh, to get familiar with coding within different platforms, Python, SQL, R, uh, to, get, to get up to speed on those. Okay, uh, a third question someone asking, uh, in your op opinion, what is the um, uh, best library to use to have a uh, good data visualization? Yeah, so that's a good question. So if you're talking about, um, for example, within Python, uh, which I use quite often myself, I like to use the um, uh, Plotly and Cufflinks. Plotly and Cufflinks have really good visualization uh, that are interactive. Uh, so I would use those. If you want simpler ones, that take less time uh, if you have a large data sets. I would use for Seaborn. Uh, Seaborn is also very powerful and with combination of matplotlib, you know, libraries. But yeah, if you want, if you want interactive type of visualizations, uh, you know, such as, you know, to replicate what Spotfire or, you know, Power BI does, mm -hmm. you can use Plotly or Cufflinks, you know, uh, to get very nice visualization uh, plot. But, but just remember that when you use Plotly and Cufflinks, you know, if you have a large data set, it can really slow your computer down unless you're running this on the cloud, you know. Uh, okay, I, I have a, um, a fourth question. Someone asking about, uh, do you recommend any open sources, or open data sources like uh, websites to uh, practice uh, machine learning? Sure, absolutely. I mean, uh, when you first start off, uh, remember that you don't have access to any data, especially if you're a student, what are you gonna do, right? So you can use open source, um, you know, uh, live or open source websites to access and just practice with the data. But just remember that, you know, a lot of these open source like information has been, has been around for a long time. People have done a lot of analysis on them. You know, uh, real life could be a little bit more different. It could be a little more challenging, you know, when you don't have, you know, a, a nice, you know, uh, really nice Excel that has, that has been filtered and uh, removed all the bad points and everything else. So you can practice with those to start off, but just remember that when you start, for example, on a project, on a, on a, real, on a real life project, it could be much more challenging than just using, um, you know, a, a one of these open source, you know, uh, Excel files. But absolutely, if you don't have access to any data, just use the open source data until, you know, you start working for somebody and you have access, then you can start analyzing the data. Okay, two more questions. Yep. Uh, someone asking about uh, how to know that the, our model is converging. Yeah, so that goes back to your, um, uh, you know, cross-validation, right, to make sure that uh, you can, there are different techniques to make sure your model first off converges. Uh, one is, uh, as I said, when you do a train test split or when you do any type of other cross-validations, uh, when you have, for example, a training accuracy of 95% and your testing accuracy is close to your training accuracy, then the likelihood of your model converging is pretty high, right? But when you have a training accuracy of 95% and your testing is low, uh, you know, the, your, your model is probably overfitted and probably not converging. So what you can do here, if I go back to the slide here, this is, for example, showing the um, uh, testing loss function, you know, in an ANN like net, uh, network as a function of number of iterations. So as you increase the number of iterations, you wanna visualize this loss function, okay? Visualize this loss function to make sure it is constantly going down, you know? If, you're, if this loss function starts going up and starts acting weird, that means your, your, your model is, is not converging, right? But if this loss function continuously goes down and it, like eventually it, it doesn't really 
might go down as much, that means, you know, uh, you have, um, you know, uh, converged this model based on the hyperparameters that you have selected in your model. So again, remember this loss function is associated with, for example, this, this many number of neurons, you know, so the way to make sure, you know, your model is converging is to make sure that, you know, it is, it is this, this, if you plot your loss function uh, or your cost function, they also call it cost function as a function of iterations, it is, it is going down and also plot it for your, for, for both training and testing set to make sure they're both going down. This is one, this is one way of doing it. Okay, so uh, the last question for today is uh, someone asking about uh, what is the difference between Seaborn library and Orange library and which one is better? Yeah, so Seaborn, I haven't used, you said the, the next one was Orange library? Yes. Okay, I haven't used the Orange library myself, but I've used Seaborn quite uh, often. I couldn't tell you the differences between the two, but I, but I can tell you that Seaborn is uh, powerful visualization libraries for doing all kinds of plots like distribution, box, violin, um, scatter, any type of plot that you can imagine, you can do those within, within the Seaborn library. Um, uh, it's very easy to use. Uh, like for example, if you want to plot a distribution plot, is the syntax is simply SNS, you know, dot displot for distribution plot or SNS dot box plot for box plots, you know? So it's very easy to use. Uh, it's not hard to use at all. Um, I, I, I simply, Seaborn is probably one of my favorite libraries, one of my favorite visualization libraries within Python. Uh, I haven't used Orange, so I couldn't comment on that. Haas, uh, thank you very much. It was an amazing webinar and uh, wish you, uh, you know, a great uh, rest of the day. Thank you very much. Also, I wish to uh, see you very soon, uh, you know, giving more webinars with us. Yeah, sure. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate okay. everybody. And, and for the audience, uh, have a wonderful, um, you know, uh, evening. Have a wonderful uh, night and see you tomorrow.